of the CGI Action Network on post-disaster recovery. My name is Jacqueline Emanuel Flood, no pun intended, with a last name like that. <laughs> and I serve as the head of the Competitive Business Unit of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, we commonly call the OECS. The Competitive Business Unit supports and facilitates business growth and development in the 10 OECS member states through the promotion of entrepreneurship, trade, and the enhancement of the business environment. First, I want to thank you so much for being here today and engaging with the Action Network. We do appreciate you taking time off your very busy schedules to come together and support recovery and resilience in the Caribbean region. Our session this morning will focus on opportunities to invest in and support Dominica. This topic is important to me and to my organization because the devastating effects of Hurricane Maria on Dominica has fueled our determination to work together to build a more resilient region. This is indeed the spirit and the letter of the revised Treaty of Bastille, which establishes our union. Dominica is at the forefront, providing the rest of the OECS an experiential platform to which rebuilding better, responding quicker, and recovering faster can be understood. As you know, the goal of the Action Network is to drive the creation of new, specific, and measurable commitments to action that will address key issues in the hurricane recovery and long-term resilience of the Caribbean region. Throughout this session and today's meeting, you will be hearing about many exciting new commitments to action that members of the Action Network have been hard at work developing since the August meeting. Please keep an ear out for those commitments and consider how you can support existing efforts or develop a commitment of your own. To this end, I am thrilled to introduce our first speaker this morning, Amy Rosenblatt-Louis, Executive Director of the Beverly Foundation. The Beverly Foundation has engaged in substantial grant making in Dominica, and Amy will be sharing more about this work, as well as announcing an exciting new commitment to action. Please join me in welcoming Amy. Thank you, Jacqueline, and good morning, everyone. Ah. My name is Amy Rosenblatt-Louis, and I'm the Executive Director of the Beverly Foundation in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I want to start today by thanking the Clinton Foundation for this remarkable gathering, giving us the space and the time to connect and create uh, great experiences together. I'm going to provide a few opening remarks on behalf of my friend and mentor and the founder of the Beverly Foundation, Beverly Dyckel. Our panel this morning will focus on Dominica. To those who know it, Dominica is a jewel. The rhythm of life, its beautiful setting, the music, but most of all, its warm and welcoming people call to anyone who's been there. Dominica drew me in from my very first visit. Bev fell in love with the island, and together with her partner, Patrice Oscar, they built a business, an eco-resort, called Rosalie Bay Resort. She has lived in Dominica for over 20 years. Bev's commitment to Dominica was not only to build her life there and to build jobs, stronger economy by promoting tourism, it was to build real partnerships and create relationships with nonprofit organizations and exceptional leaders who were all about helping the most vulnerable people on the island have a good life. The mission of the Beverly Foundation is, is to help the vulnerable through the Jewish value of tikkun olam, or repairing the world. We do that by being a responsive funder working in community to strengthen the Jewish community in Minneapolis, in Israel, and Dominica because of Bev's unique commitment to the island. This support has focused on literacy, human services, and turtle conservation. As Bev often says to me, the traditional Jewish values of her parents, Rose and Manny Fingerhut, made them great teachers, so the foundation works tirelessly to follow in their footsteps. It is our firm commitment that in all the organizations and all the communities that we're involved with, we strive to lead by example and do it with kindness and humility. When Hurricane Maria hit Dominica, 
We watched as the storm intensified and swept over the island. We didn't hear from our friends for days, and they, like so many others, walked to Usola the capital. With our partners, we sprung into action immediately, connecting with everyone and anyone who could help. And what made all the difference was a very simple thing that guides the efforts of anybody who works a lifetime to make a difference in their community, strong human relationships. Bonds of friendship and caring that make people help one another. The foundation had dedicated a lifetime to building these bonds, and when Dominica was at risk, we worked with our partners to act quickly while the need was the greatest. We partnered with Jake Levinson of Oceans Forward and Dom Setko, our sea turtle conservation organizations, who reached out through his huge network of marine biologists to tap many generous people, including members of the Dominican diaspora and others in the United States. They filled his trucks with relief supplies until they reached their final destination, a waiting cargo jet in Miami that Jake had miraculously found to fly the supplies to St. Lucia. There, generators and other essential items were added into the mix and loaded onto two ferries to reach the eastern side of the island. There's some amazing stories there. Our partners brought things that couldn't be found in, on the island, including, including insulin, diapers, special foods for the disabled and the elderly, and helped not only people, but their pets, bringing pet food too. We worked with Lisa Gerwich of Delivering Good and Marcella Lopez Macedonia of the Resource Foundation, our international intermediary, who distributed gift cards to give hundreds of people access to emergency casts. Liz Bardu and Pastor Lina of Community Dream Center in Maho sheltered 300 Dominicans who unexpectedly found themselves homeless and without food. By the way, their roof still needs to be completed. Harriet Linsky of Hands Across the Sea and our literacy team worked tirelessly to survey the school libraries in the hope of getting them back online. Finally, there was ISRA aid. When ISRAID, Israel's remarkable nonprofit humanitarian aid organization, heard of the need in Dominica from the foundation, not a second was lost as a team, which was nearby, finishing work on quake relief in Mexico, was immediately dispatched to the island. We were lucky to find a partner that understood we were not interested in only immediate disaster response, but a leader who would commit to being our long-term partner five to seven years to tackle the work of resiliency in the areas they know best. One of the most important questions they asked us, do you have any relationships on the ground? Why, yes, we do. So the work included bringing trained first responders, doctors and nurses, which staffed the rural clinics in the east that otherwise would have been unable to care for people. Building temporary shelters to get people out of the, out of the rain. Deploying water engineers, supplying filters to bring clean water. Sending trained professionals to help people with the stress of trauma and to cope with their huge loss. Creating safe school places while working with the Ministry of Education to get the schools open. By the way, this work has led to the formation of a disaster risk reduction plan that's in every school. And even though our work was a drop in the bucket, all our resources and the strength of our partners was thrown into the task. Our network of agencies has leveraged our support with other agencies. This has helped us seamlessly move from disaster response to long-term action in working with all of our communities. Our grantee partnerships and relationships are our family and friends, and those bonds run deep. Our stories of survival and perseverance in this disaster are part of the narration of our work and really the soul of what we're doing. The hurricane has taught us that friendship and relationships can weather any storm. Networks and connections make things happen and may really make the world a better place. Now it's time to ask the right questions and build a better framework. We are in this work for the long term and we need your help to be bold. If this is the nature island, how are we protecting our nature and our blue ocean? And our blue ocean? Because our economy is based on her. What's our plan? How can, how can we sustainably feed ourselves? Just like we heard in the panel yesterday, where are our farmers, our aquapods, and food forests in our climate resilient plan? We need to talk about this. Why don't we start a foundation for Dominica to support and tackle our nonprofit agencies and to, and to deal with some of the major systemic issues? As one of the only private funders who funds the island, we need your help to build new networks and friendships. With this in mind, and on behalf of Beverly Dyko, the force behind the Beverly Foundation, and Patrice Oscar, we would like to announce a new CGI commitment with Israel as our partner. It's called Support for Young Entrepreneurs in Dominica. 
The challenge we're addressing is economic development and youth employment. Not a new issue, especially in the Southeast, but one that is critical to our resilience and recovery. After a deep needs assessment, we have created a pilot program that trains youth 17 to 24 and equips them with skills, mentorships, knowledge, business moxie, in a series of hackathon style incubator activities using innovation, iteration, creativity, and teamwork to hatch businesses. The first cohort held their hackathon at Rosalie Bay this past December, and 25 youth from the East, including five people from the Kawanago, participated. It was wildly successful. I saw great pictures. Um, this, the program includes training with monthly meetings and seed funding to help those businesses grow. Under the direction of Hannah Gavanta, Dominica Country Director for Israel and her team, we would like to scale this program all over the island. We have built the model. Now it's time to expand the numbers and seed funding. Come speak to me about stepping up. I'm very excited to hear about our panel this morning. So join us as we work in community to help repair, rebuild, and to become a more resilient beacon of light to the Caribbean and the world. We all dream of a rebuilt Dominica. Thank you for coming here to make this a reality. Thank you so much, Amy. I really admire the work that the Beverly Foundation is leading in Dominica, and I am thrilled about the new commitment to action. I think um, one of the things that really stood out for me was when Beverly said, relationships and friendships can weather any storm. Um, I think that I'll, I'll borrow that phrase from you in future. I think it's so, so meaningful. And I think for the OEC, OECS, I can speak for the OECS, that we would love to talk to you after about your entrepreneurship program that you want to scale up in Dominica. So I would encourage anyone who wants to hear more about it to you know, find, find Amy after this session and to speak with her. So I really want to say thank you, Amy, again. Um, I, am, I think it's really wonderful work that you're doing. Let me move on now. To, I would like to introduce to you Pep Badwin. Pep Badwin. Um, let me say that um, Pep is the CEO of the Climate Resilient Execution Agency in Dominica. It's quite a, a task called, called CREED, and you'll be hearing from Pep as she represents an incredibly ambitious plan that has been set forth by Dominica to not only rebuild after the devastation of 2017, but to thrive as a model of climate resilience at scale for the whole world. I say the whole world, and I say that the OECS is definitely right there with you. So please join me in welcoming Pep. Good morning. Um, I have uh, sort of an issue in terms of speaking too quickly, and I'm going to try and speak slowly. The problem is that I have a lot to say, um, and I realize that I don't have a lot of time. Uh, so thank you again for being here. Uh, I was born in Dominica. I'm a, a family from Dominica, from a place called Point Michel, uh, which is one of the parts of the country that was most significantly affected in terms of deaths. Um, but I grew up elsewhere. I grew up in Zambia, in Ethiopia, in England, in France, uh, in the US, in a number of places. Um, therefore, the opportunity to come back to Dominica, my country of birth, not just to live, but to lead an agency that is doing essentially what no one else has done is absolutely um, thrilling, but it is also a massive, massive task and something we can't do on our own. So um, a couple of words on the Climate Resilience Execution Agency of Dominica, CREED, um, as we call it, if I can figure out which button to press to move forward, the big green one. Um, many people have said, can Dominica do this? Uh, there have been inspirational statements in newspapers, Bloomberg, um, you know, uh, The Economist, it's been covered everywhere. Uh, but the reality is that we don't have a choice um, Dominica must become climate resilient. But more than that, if you cannot do it in Dominica, how can you do it in Indonesia? How can you do it in Malaysia? How can you do it in countries of tens of millions of people? Um, so I like to think that Dominica is small and sort of you know, beautiful, but it is also possible. 70,000 people 
Um, you're one, two, three degrees of separation away from everyone, which means that already there is solidarity. But more than that, you can reach people. Um, and I don't see much hope for the planet if we can't get Dominica to get, um, to get this journey right. So yes, it's ambitious. Um, if it is unsurmountable, then I would say globally we have a serious issue. Uh, for Dominica, and I'm not sure what's going on with the slides here though, resilience is more than just about climate. Um, we have vulnerability um, related to our environmental ecosystem, right? We have vulnerability related to um, fragile natural environments. We also have earthquakes. Um, Dominica has nine dormant volcanoes, which I just learned is actually the highest concentration of volcanoes anywhere in the world, so that's a problem. Um, there are also challenges in terms of economic vulnerability. Uh, essentially, Dominica is a very, very, very small grain of sand on a large beach, um, and we know that uh, the world is in economic turmoil right now simply because of statements that are being made. So how does that affect a small island developing state? And beyond that, we have social vulnerability. Like every country, there are social issues that you have to deal with. They may be more or less in this direction or that direction for Dominica, but first, Dominica must be viable as a society, then sustainable as a society and an economy and a nature island, and then resilient as a country, and then climate resilient. So we see climate resilience as, um, I don't want to call it the cherry on the top because it runs through everything else that we do, uh, but it is part of an overall development pathway that Dominica needs to get right that is not just about climate. That means that the general development direction uh, needs to be thought through holistically, needs to incorporate climate and not just be focused on climate. Um, very difficult to see this picture, but broadly speaking, we're looking then at building strong communities, at building a sustainable economy, and at building adaptive inf infrastructure. So we're not talking about infrastructure that never collapses. We're not talking about every house withstanding a Category 5 hurricane or you know, a 7.5 Richter scale earthquake. We're talking about the ability to bounce back. Um, so yes, we need to build back better, but do we build back perfect? Perfect for what? For earthquakes, for hurricanes, for floods, for sea level rise? It's impossible. No country can afford that. So what you then need is elasticity in the system. And a couple of ways of thinking about infrastructure are the following. One, we make everything totally durable, can't afford it. Uh, the second is that we try and bounce back better, but in order to bounce back, you need people with money in their pockets. They need to have their homes insured. They need to be able to survive maybe a week, a month, two months, three months without a job while the economy recovers. And the economy itself needs to be able to bounce back. So if there's an earthquake or a hurricane and tourists don't come for six months or nine months or 12 months, how do you survive? So we need to create structures, um, be it reserves in the government coffers or reserves in people's pockets, um, or food supplies, food stores that people have in their homes, or the ability to farm, uh, to at least feed themselves with basic, um, basic nutritional inputs so that they can survive uh, a tragedy. It's not just about building um, an unbreakable uh, set of roads, bridges, and um, buildings. And I think that that's what makes it very complicated. I'm not going to stand up here and say, well, these are all the things that we have to do and we can do them right now. Um, we have to do them bitwise, we have to do them stepwise, but we cannot do them as pilots and we cannot do them as projects. We have to do them at grand scale, otherwise we're not going to get to where we need to go. Um, so it's a bit of a, uh, if you think about this, it's kind of putting ourselves in a vortex where we have to deliver big, we have to deliver quickly, we have to deliver affordably, we have to deliver across all sectors, and that's incredibly challenging, but that's the way you solve problems globally. It's not by living in a silo. So, those are the three thematic areas, but there are two cross-cutting areas that we absolutely have to get right. One is public institutions. Um, why public institutions? Because countries have governments, and all governments are there to help put into place mechanisms for the country to function. So this is not a Dominica-specific issue, this is a global issue. If your institutions function well, if you have the data that you need to make very, very well-informed decisions, and you have decision-making protocols, if your policies and legislation are up to date, if they're appropriate, if they're supportive of your sustainable development pathway, and if they're implementable, and you don't just spend time thinking about developing the policy, but about how you execute on the policy. If you have plans that are data-driven, compelling, actionable, and financeable. If you have processes from procurement to monitoring and evaluation, to project management, to enforcement um, that are put into place. If you have structures, division of labor across government ministries, across agencies, between the public and the private sector, so who's best placed, including the social sector, like the Beverly Foundation. Um, and if you have capacity, so skills within the workforce, but also across the country, then you've kind of delivered on that broader public institution piece. But more important than that is collective consciousness. 
Amy spoke about post-traumatic stress. I was not in Dominica for the hurricane, but I can tell you, having come to Puerto Rico and Dominica in the month of July before the hurricane, um, the country has changed. People are different. Um, they look different, their eyes are different, their focus is different, their presence is different. Why? Because just like after Hurricane David that people talked about for 37 years, until Hurricane Maria came along, it's affected people. Um, so we can say, Dominicans, pick up your socks, you know, pull up your socks, put on your hat, rebuild, that's fine. That's all well and good, but that's saying it when you have a roof over your head, you have food in your stomach, and you're not worrying about where your food or your job is going to come from tomorrow. So I think we have to work on a collective consciousness, and we have to do that sensitively. But generally speaking, Dominicans have to believe that there is a future for them in Dominica. Young Dominicans have to not feel that their only future is escaping the island, going somewhere else to have a better opportunity. Older Dominicans have to feel that they can stand up strong, look after their families, and feel pride again. So we have to unbreak what has been chipped away and broken. Um, Dominicans are not broken. Dominicans are indomitable from generations. Um, you know, I like to say that from the Kalinago through the slaves to Dominicans of today, Dominicans have been indomitable. But there's a certain amount of care that needs to go into the recovery. Um, at the same time, people have to believe that it can be done. So we need a stronger collective consciousness, otherwise we cannot achieve this. Creed cannot achieve this on our own. Uh, the Beverly Foundation, the government, no one can do this on our own if the 70,000 people in Dominica do, do not believe that they can or should or will be able to, uh, to, to sort of achieve resilience. And finally, and this is turning to the glass half full, um, Dominica is a jewel. It has assets, um, it has um, beauty, um, but very specifically, apart from the indomitable nature of the country, the history, the culture, the lived experience, we have geology. Geology makes Dominica volcanic, which you know, gives us some risks, but at the same time, um, we have geothermal resources. Dominica is in the process of building a seven megawatt geothermal plant for local consumption, domestic consumption. We have export potential for the islands of Martinique and Guadeloupe. We have rainforests, so we should talk about the green economy and how we monetize those green assets. We have the blue economy, so we need to monetize that. So this is all glass half full. Now I know I might run out of time, but let me just pitch very quickly three areas where I really would like everyone in the room and your networks to consider supporting. Firstly, a Dominica, Dom, Dominica Strong smartphone app. Um, I can go through this with you in detail. This is not just about emergency warning. This is about helping everyone have in their pocket information on what they need to do to build resilience in their, in their person, in their family, in their home, in their community. So how much water do I need to store? How do I dry food? Um, you know, what do I need to teach my children? It's also about reaching people in cases of emergency. There are nine people on dialysis up in the north. We need to get to them first. So it provides an interface to the government response team, the Office of Disaster Management, who's very excited about the opportunity, and also to the National Emergency Planning Organization that then manages cases of disaster. But outside of cases of disaster, it connects communities. Where can I volunteer? Who has extra food that I can benefit from if I'm uh, in need? Not everyone has a smartphone, but everyone knows someone who has a smartphone. So we believe that we can reach people and possibly the whole population through an app. Secondly, and this is something we've developed with Jake and his team, what we're calling Resiliency, which is a multi-dimensional um, ecosystem project that looks at keeping our reefs safe, keeping our turtles safe, building ecotourism, training youth, particularly young women, putting them into employment, looking at seafood production, drying, the whole, the whole value chain. I don't have time to go through this, but I can assure you that this is a holistic thinking approach and something that we think could be quite exciting for anyone who cares about oceans, tourism, and employment. And finally, I really want someone to put their hand up for this. Dominica's story has not been captured in a single place. Dominica's hurricane experience hasn't been captured. Dominica's resilience hasn't been captured. We need a museum. We need to upgrade our museum. We need a local library that helps students, local people, understand that their journey has been documented, is respected, is appreciated, and can provide a lot of input um, to the rest of the world. If we want to be resilient, we must speak resilience, we must know resilience. Every tourist who comes to Dominica must experience resilience. They must see the, the poetry, the, the drawings of young children who've been affected by this. They must be put into a wind tunnel, and that's a 4D experience. You jump into the museum, you go into a wind tunnel, you go from category one, two, three, four, five, you feel a hurricane, you put on your 3D glasses, you see the trees falling, you put on your, micro, your, your earphones, you hear people screaming. That is what people globally need to change. Climate is changing, take that information back, go and talk to your senator, go and talk to your representative and say, you know, we need to do X, Y, and Z. Or think about how you use your car. 
Think about whether you turn your lights on. If you leave Dominica unaffected by the beauty of the place, that is wonderful, but you should leave it unaffected, I'm sorry, excuse me. If you leave it affected by the beauty of the country, that's wonderful. But if you leave it unaffected by the experience of the people whose beauty you've come to enjoy, then you've done a disservice to the experience of Dominicans. Um, so please come and talk to us about this. We have tremendous ideas and we're here to execute. We're not here to talk, we're not here to dilly-dally. Um, so we need partners who are willing to support us through experience, through funding, through networks, um, and we will help you deliver point blank. Thank you. Thank you, Pep. Um, don't leave. Um, she did say she had a lot to say. So um, I am going to invite you to take a seat. With the conversation will continue. We'll be moving into a panel discussion format, and I would like to invite um, Baroness Scotland from the Commonwealth to join us. At, at, yes, please join the panel. And also Lisa Fabian, who is the Executive Director of the Dominican Association of Industry and Congress, will also be joining us. Um, call to action for Dominica. Dominica indeed is a very, very lovely place. And um, I want to perhaps begin with Baroness first. You know, you left Dominica, Baroness, at a very young age, but you've remained connected to Dominica. And that Dominica is very special to you. Um, what do you think is, I would say, the, the pepper in the sauce, whatever that going to make Dominica, help Dominica recover at this particular time after this, this Devastation. Well, I think um, you've had a flavor of it by listening to Pep talk. If you wanted to know what Dominican people are like, I think you've had a feast yesterday and today. So resilience is at its core. But let me uh, say why it's important that we do this from a Commonwealth perspective because I appear on this panel as a, the Secretary General of 53 countries, responsible, therefore, for 2.4 billion people, 60% of whom are under the age of 30. Dominica's experience is an example of the experience which could happen to any of us. For many years, the Commonwealth has been fighting very hard to get the world to acknowledge that climate change was real. As I said yesterday, many people thought that this was just sophistry and that we were crying wolf. Well, in 2017, the wolf ate our lunch. And if we're not careful globally, they'll come back and it will now eat us. And therefore, I think it's uh, critically important for us to see what the experience of Dominica showed us. And Pepe is absolutely right. This is about resilience of every nature. It's not just climate. I was particularly pleased that they were highlighting the need for good governance. Because our experience in the Commonwealth is that if we are to do this, it has to be regenerative form of development. We've got to create that elasticity, that flexibility. And the questions we've been asking the Commonwealth is how do we do that? And many of you, I hope, will have looked at our website, which is thecommonwealth.org, because we are building the instruments which hopefully we'll be able to share. And we have an opportunity in Dominica because Dominica has been absolutely devastated. But it gives us a unique opportunity because most of the time when we start on a journey, we would say we wouldn't have started from here. And it is virtually impossible for us to deconstruct all the things that have been constructed which we really should deconstruct. 
One of the terrible things that has happened as a result of Maria is Dominica was in effect flattened. So we are able to reconstruct without deconstructing because Maria has already deconstructed for us. And that means that we can look holistically at what a regeneratively developed country could look like. Dominica, regrettably, but beneficially for us as a commonwealth and for the world, has every problem known to man in one country. Earthquakes, volcanoes, um, uh, shocks in terms of um, uh, our sea. It's a big blue ocean state. But it is, as we've been told, small enough to have a holistic plan, but large enough to be statistically significant in terms of developing a plan that will work for others. We know that if the world is to develop, it's going to be through the productivity and economic growth of our cities. Well, Dominica is about the size of a small city. So it's replicable. And this opportunity is here now if we can pool our expertise. Because I believe we do have the majority of the answers that we need to develop Dominica if, as I said yesterday, we choose to do it. And I want to say to everyone, this is a choice. And if we choose not to do it, we have to understand that has consequences. So what have we in the Commonwealth done? I said yesterday we were about implementation. We've spent years and years talking about policy. And what this meeting is about is what are we now going to do? So the Commonwealth has created uh, implementation toolkits. We now have 43 of them. And it is about, um, it's here, we missed the 43, my question over there. Um, and these 43 toolkits are about how we get the governance arrangements to work together in a holistic way to deliver change. We need the laws, but then we need to implement them. We've looked at creating a sustainable development toolkit because what we saw on that screen is the answer to how do we deliver on all 17 SDGs. And that's really, really important. If we are a blue nation state, most of the islands are not little landlocked islands. They are big blue ocean states. So how do we develop that blue economy? We've created the blue charter, and we have eight action groups that we want to help our countries to deliver. So how are we going to fund those? Pooling our expertise is what's important. And so the Commonwealth Secretariat is creating like a docking station into which all the networks can come. So we can be the networkers of the networkers. And so I'm going to ask all of us here not just to think about Dominica as one simple, small country, but to see if Dominica is our opportunity to implement and learn what we need to do for everyone else, each of us in each of our countries. How are we going to make this happen? And so I would invite us all to think about the three things that we are going to do as a result of coming that we would not have done if we had not come. And the ladies in the room, please feel free to do 100. We can do this if we choose. And I really hope, I really hope we will because what Pepper's just um, described is actually the Commonwealth way. Holistic, joined up, but focusing on delivery, focusing on action. I think most of us have had enough talk, and I think and I hope what we'll be talking about now is, so what are we gonna do? And what are we gonna do today? If we save Dominica, I reckon we'll 
say all of this. Thank you. Very profound indeed. And I think that. <laughs> very profound. Um, I think you have really made it very crystal clear to us where Dominica sits, not just as a region, but globally. And thank you for that. Um, I would like to talk to us, this Rado. I mean, a lot has been happening see, globally. A lot of our social partners are in this room. Um, I want to ask, how would you describe the, the private sector in Dominica at the moment? And what are some of the key opportunities that exist for investment in the private sector? How is the private sector partnering with what's happening um, in Dominica and globally? Okay, great. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's, it's been an experience for the private sector. Mario was not like any other time for us. And our private sector is also a representation of how each of us have been affected by Hurricane Maria. I would say individually, this was the longest night of everyone's life. And for our business community, it's been an experience trying to recover by pulling our resources together and every day taking measurable decisions and actions to be able to rebound. One of the, the key things that stood out to me after Hurricane Maria was when one of my directors mentioned that literally we are not going to do it overnight. It's going to take some time. So our private sector, we've been working extremely hard every day to ensure that we can restore our infrastructure, such as our utilities, our telecommunications across Dominica. And we've been making, I would say, impressive strides based on, on the, the way we were affected. Our telecommunication companies have restored internet in terms of LTE service throughout the island. Our road, we've been able to access the, the major areas in Dominica. Our electricity has been reconnected through most of the island. So we are seeing progress through our private sector. Our retail sector began shortly after Hurricane Maria to ensure that we could continue and we could bounce back in terms of our commerce. So this is one of the areas that we are seeing tremendous growth because individuals are transacting even more than they did before. We, we're seeing growth in terms of certain sectors more prominently than others, such as our construction sector. I believe that all construction companies who want to do work, there are opportunities for them and there's, there's so much work to be done that we need increasing capacity. So for the private sector, there are new opportunities, there have been new opportunities for OECS, all the OECS companies to join us and all the countries from the CARICOM to come across the Dominica to help us in our rebuilding efforts. Um, as DIC, DIC, I represent the Chamber of Commerce in Dominica. We've supported our businesses in different ways to ensure that our business community can increase, can improve. Um, we did a, a research after the hurricane to understand how our businesses were affected, which will help to inform us of how best to support our businesses. This helped to inform on the short-term needs, medium-term and long-term needs. And as a result of this, we engaged in a number of initiatives. One of these was a business recovery expo where we pulled together a large proportion of our private sector to speak about how to, how to plan to mitigate disaster risk, how to bring back our business, access to finance, um, using innovation and technology and also energy, energy um, sufficiency to help to improve our businesses. But we also had a, a Connect to Rebuild grant assistance program where we looked to support our small businesses through a grant assistance. They applied, we evaluated these applications and we connected some of these businesses with resources to get tools to, to bounce back in their business. We've seen opportunities for, for new areas that didn't exist before. We have new hardware companies, a new hardware company right now, and some new ones have, re, well, have opened the doors, and they're looking at specific areas that we didn't have before. So there have been lots of opportunities for the private sector, and I would say there are tremendous opportunities moving forward. Pep mentioned a number of areas of how we can partner with you in this room, and Baroness Scotland mentioned of what are we going to do to make this possible. There are other opportunities in Dominica, such as using your expertise to help us to bridge a gap where we do not have the resources locally. We want to ensure that we use our green economy and blue economy, but we don't have all the resources in Dominica. One of the things I believe that will help to inspire our business community is to network with international partners, which will open up our minds and our understanding of how things are done internationally and no one country, I would say, have the answer. 
the US by itself would not have the perfect answer or solution to, to just imitate it in Dominica, by, but by pooling with all our partners internationally, with our regional partners as well, in Puerto Rico and the BVI. I've been connected with some here, and I understood that there's tremendous work being done in particular areas. But using all these best practices with our private sector, there can be even more opportunities for us. I think we also need support in terms of strategic management to help our businesses, not just think of how we can provide some value to, to Dominicans by just opening a business to, to serve Dominicans, but how can we internationalize our business? You have the expertise and you have the experience as well. And we really encourage you to, to speak to us as to how we can bridge these gaps in Dominica for private sector, technical expertise. I must mention though that we're also looking at a mentorship program for our women, or women leaders specifically, but also for other business leaders who want to ensure that they understand how to do things better, not just reaching back to how we were pre-Maria, but ensuring that we are much better, we achieve the vision of being climate resilient, the first climate resilient country in the world. It's a tall order, and we say it often, and we, we speak this vision, but we want to ensure that we take all the steps that's measurable to achieve this. Well, you left up at a very good point. Thank you so much, Lisa, because it is, it is a big vision, but I think Dominica has articulated it. I think the fact that you were speaking it shows your conviction, which brings me back to Pep. Because Pep, you, in fact, seem to be the one at, in, the, in the midst of it all. Um, you, what you've described there really does seem like quite a lot. So I want to ask you, you know, what do you perceive to be the challenges? And I want to make sure that the audience gets very crystal clear understanding of how they can build a relationship with you. Um, because you seem to be the one spinning the wheel uh, at the heart of the wheel. Could you help us? Uh, absolutely. Um, look, I think the challenges are no different than the challenges you face anywhere else. Um, they're human challenges. Uh, I find, I'm an engineer by training, but I spent half my life in management consulting. Um, and I find that you can have a technical solution to anything, but when you deal with human beings in terms of getting them to be convinced about it, or implementing it, or changing their way of being, of doing, of, uh, of acting, um, that's, where you, that's where you run into the challenges. I don't, I don't think anything is unsurmountable. Um, what we have to do is put into place, I think, approaches, and what we plan to do, what we are doing, um, is put into place approaches that people believe make sense for them. So if you sort of segment society, and it's all about segmentation, into the individual, the individual needs to feel right now, thanks very much, Creed, for talking about resilience, but right now, what are you doing for me? The reality is that we can't do for everyone. And so once we separate and say, look, you cannot come against the vision or, 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 or sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater, throw the vision out because no one was able to help you right now. You have to understand that there's some things that you can do to help yourself. There's some things that, frankly, you won't be able to do and you may just have to wait. Um, if we get distracted by trying to make everyone's life perfect, we won't fix the system. And I think the Baron has highlighted something um, which I've actually written down, which is, you know, Maria, deconstructed it. Now let's reconstruct it the right way. Um, if we get distracted, we will reconstruct things in a way that's suiting some people, but then does not serve the country long term. Um, it is very difficult, but the reality is that we have to put into place structures that people will follow. Those structures need to be followed first and foremost by people in government. Um, if individuals look up and do not see the system functioning in the right way, they have license to do whatever they want. It's a little bit like laws, right? You know, you follow the law until you hear about a politician, um, you know, in, in the US or, or in India or China who, you know, I don't know, ran a red light or, you know, or didn't pay taxes or something. Then you say, fine, I can do it too. You may have thought about doing it before, but now you really can do it because someone up there decided. So I think that every um, person in a position of power, be it government leaders or private sector leaders or social sector leaders need to model um, deliver. So we at Creed are not going to go and say, well, we're going to train the, the public sector in how, you know, how to do public management because we know how to do 
procurement, or we know how to recruit people better. We're not going to come in here and tell you how to do it. We're going to deliver ourselves. So Creed is an execution agency. It's not the training agency. It's not the capacity building agency. We will do. We absorb people into the agency through secondments. Um, we put people from the agency into government departments or into private sector organizations where we've said to DIC, how do we come and support you? And we show you how we would do it. Now, that doesn't mean it's a perfect way. You can tell us that's great, Pat, but you know what? Maybe go a little bit to the right or a bit to the left. We adjust, but we do it together. Our approach is a flagship. It's not a project, because projects suggest that we deliver the project, then it's done. A flagship is a way of doing things. It puts lots of complex pieces together, and then it shows you that you can solve the problem, so that when you have your next big problem, because there will be many problems for the next, Cree's life is four years, but for the next four years, 14 years, 24 years, Dominique is going to be on this journey. You need to learn how to solve problems. That's the first thing. And then when we get to the individual level, um, I think this is a little, and I'll be very honest with you, I think this is a little bit trickier. Um, you've got to help people believe that it's possible. That sort of mindset, that's hearts and minds. Um, when I think about countries that have gone, the US that's gone into you know, an Iraq or an Afghanistan and has tried to tell people on the ground, we're here to help you, that's hearts and minds. How you do that is complicated. We need to do it in a way that makes sense for Dominicans. We're starting on that journey, so if anyone has done anything around collective consciousness, let's talk. Um, but what we're trying to do is hear from the bottom up what people think they need. Thank you so much. I think Sorry, and in terms of collaborating with Creed, just please come and find me. We will find a way to partner, and I mean seriously partner on action. Thank you for that. Um, it's amazing how fast the time is going, but I just want to say that I think you are absolutely convincing. Um, Baroness, I think we have all tasted the sauce. Um, we do believe in Dominica. Um, it's just watching you and listening to you, that, that spirit, that indomitable spirit, of Dominica is very, very visible. So I think you've done a very wonderful first step. And I can assure you that the rest of the OECS are watching. We recognize the opportunity that we have in Dominica being deconstructed, as bad as it sounds, that we have an opportunity to learn to be first-hand. It's a real lab for us. And we are, we are with you in, in, not just in spirit, but in action. Um, our time has gone by very, very quickly, and I, um, so I would like to just <coughs> allow the Baroness and Israel to have a final word. Um, we are counting down to the final minute, so Baroness, please go ahead. Um, I'd really like um, everyone's help and support to populate the Innovation Hub. The Commonwealth has brought together the Innovation Hub so that we can pool expertise and knowledge, which will then be capable of being shared by everyone. If we are to do this, we're going to have to have access to what everybody knows. But also, I think we have to pull what we don't know and the things that have gone wrong. Because what we're finding is so many of us are trying with all our hearts to do something and are doing it very logically. But having done it, it doesn't always work. So I want us to be in the position if any one of us spends one dollar one penny, then no other member will have to spend the same dollar or the same penny. So we'll really be able to share expertise and knowledge, and we will create a community of practitioners who will be there to help when the need arises, but not just one of us, to help all of us, because I think we're all in this together. Great. Well, I also want to encourage everyone to reach out to us in terms of our private sector, there are lots of businesses that we can connect with. And if you have expertise that can really help our businesses, and also connect to ensure that we can explore our resources in Dominica, our green economy, or blue economy, because like Pep said, we have a jewel. Dominica is a jewel, and it's waiting to be explored. I also want to share that we should leave as if that the next disaster is coming tomorrow, but we should build as if we will live forever. So whatever we are planning is not just for today or tomorrow, but it's to live as if something can happen now, but build like it will build as if we would live forever. But I also want to mention that DIC, we are partnering with our CARICOM Chambers of Commerce and also OECS Chambers of Commerce to ensure that the best practices that we have as a chamber and in Dominica, we can share it with our partners so that the other countries would not face the same thing. And that's building on, on best practices and ensuring that we don't repeat the same thing in all the islands, but we can move together. We can move forward together. Thank you so much. I think it's a wonderful note on which to end sharing 
this is an experience that's relevant to all of us. And I think we've, we've all underscored that. And I'm going to borrow from Amy that it's about relationships that are going to weather all the storms. And that's why we all are here. So I really think it's so wonderful that you've sat with us today. I want to thank you again for joining us. Please seek out the, the panelists here. They are real opportunities to network and to build that kind of relationship going forward. Um, so I want to urge you now to make your way to the plenary session, which starts promptly at 9.30, I'm told. Um, so I would like to give you sufficient time to get there. I want to thank all of you again for joining us this morning. Thank you.